By March 1890, 15 months after the discovery of Cliff Palace, Richard, either alone or with his brothers and Mason, had found and examined all of the major cliff dwellings in Mesa Verde, by his count, 182. He had named most of them, he had roughly mapped the entire area explored, and had painstakingly inspected 250 miles of the Mesa's steep, cl steep cliffs. Then followed a period of relative inactivity in the cliff dwellings. It was interrupted only by short excursions to the Mesa until the summer of 1891, when Richard, Al, and John helped Baron Nordenskold assemble a collection to take back to Sweden. Their second collection, meanwhile, had been stored in a small barn at the ranch and had become a sort of museum. To enlarge it, they had returned to dig through the winter of 1891-92. In the spring of 1892, the collection was bought by C.D. Hazard, of the H. J. Smith Exploring of Jackson Park, Illinois, and exhibited the following year at the Chicago World's Fair. When the fair ended, Hazard stored the relics in a Chicago warehouse. He moved to Los Angeles soon after, leaving the relics crated, and in the spring of 1894 advertised them for sale. No buyer appeared, and so, in April 1895, the entire collection of about a thousand specimens was shipped in 42 boxes, on two years' loan, to the Museum of the University of Pennsylvania. In the following year, the collection was bought for the museum by Mrs. Phoebe A. Hurst. A few of the relics which she had taken out for herself she presented in 1901 to the University of California at Berkeley. The Wetherill's fourth and last Mesa Verde collection was made in the summer of 1892 for the state of Colorado. This collection was taken to the Chicago Fair as part of the state's exhibit which would have been financed by legislative appropriation of $100,000. Of this collection, Charlie Mason wrote, In spite of the fact all the cliff dwellings had been worked over two or three times, we succeeded in making a good showing. When the fair ended, the collection was brought back to Denver and made a part of the Historical Society's original collection of some 1,200 specimens. Thus, the four Wetherill collections from Mesa Verde found their way into public museums, the first being bought by the Denver Historical Society, the second purchased by the H. J. Smith Exploring Company and donated finally to University of Pennsylvania Museum, the third taken to Sweden and later moved to the National Museum in Helsinki, Finland, the fourth joined with the first and placed eventually in the Colorado State Museum at Denver. The methods Richard used in excavating the ruins of Mesa Verde were direct, thorough, and consistent with the general practice of his time, but by modern archaeological standards unscientific. It had been his misfortune that certain scientists had been severe in their criticism of him, if a gentle term may be used, because he failed to employ techniques which were not devised until a generation after his death. Untutored, unskilled, and with no previous work in their field to guide them, Richard and his brothers went to work with long-handled shovels, digging until they had satisfied themselves they had uncovered everything of significance there to be found. Indeed, most of their most bitter of their critics have complained that because they have complained because they were so thorough. When the fine dust of the dry caves blinded and choked them, they tied wet, wet handkerchiefs over their faces and went on digging. When a shovel blade scraped against a scra fragile piece of pottery, a burial, or some precious find, they would put the shovel aside and scoop away dirt with their hands. The refinements of the trowel, whisk broom, and camel hair brush were unknown to them at this time. Likewise, the notes they kept contained no scrupulous record of room measurements or shirred counts that would identify the development or regression of pottery making in comparison to that of surrounding areas. In a ledger, they made brief entries, such as those John made in Johnson Canyon, of each relic discovered. With nothing written or known to draw upon for comparison, they considered these efforts sufficient. In addition to the ledger entries, Richard and Al photographed each cliff dwelling where they worked. Their pictures at this stage had more scenic interest, perhaps, than scientific value, but in any case demonstrated an attempt to document what they had found. Because he concentrated his interest on the larger cliff dwellings, Richard failed to examine thoroughly two earlier and transitional phases of culture. The most obvious signs of these were low, tumbled walls of small Pueblo structures, nearly hidden in the underbrush on the mesa's summit, and on the floor of the valleys below. Five of these structures have been excavated since 1950, all in the vicinity of Cliff Palace, and have found to be dated from 850 to 1075 A.D. Close to the small Pueblo ruins, 
There have been found numerous pit houses of the modified basket makers who are believed built and occupied them from about 450 to 750 A.D. Had Richard excavated the earlier Pueblo sites, there's little doubt he would have discovered the pit houses because in many cases they lie buried under the walls of later Pueblos. No one in Richard's time was able to determine the age of these prehistoric dwellings with any accuracy, but the differences between the basket maker and the early Pueblo cultures were too sharply marked to have escaped him. At the same time, he could then not have failed to perceive that the cliff dwellings, which flourished from 1200 to about 1300, showed third and classic period of the people's development. Some have said Richard's interest in Mesa Verde was purely mercenary, that he was a professional pot hunter. To support this, attention had been called to a statement of Charlie Mason's and to a series of advertisements of Richard published one year in the Mancos Times. The offer of the Denver Historical Society to buy the first Wetherill collection, Mason wrote years later, immediately stimulated their efforts. In December 1889, we started out to make another collection. This time we went at it in a more businesslike manner, as our previous work had been carried out more to satisfy our own curiosity than for any other purpose. But this time it was a business proposition. Richard was no longer living there, but there is reason to believe he would not have quarreled with Mason's statement. The same motive, no doubt, inspired his advertisement in the Mancos paper, appearing first in September 1894 and continuing unchanged for about a year. Mancos Canyon and Aztec Cliff Dwellings, Indian Curios, Aztec Relics, Photographs for Sale, Address, Richard Wetherill, Alamo Ranch, Mancos, Colorado. Ten days after this appeared, Richard wrote to an Eastern friend that everyone that has been here at Alamo Ranch lately wants cliff dweller relics or basket makers. The mound relics they do not seem to care about except for comparison. Richard seemed more than just willing to sell the relics which he and his brother found. About 1890, they had converted a small barn into a museum for thousands of objects in their growing, growing collection. Visitors who stopped at the ranch or came to town read, and read the local newspaper were welcome to inspect the museum, and no doubt a number of them left with purchases. Richard, however, was not the first in Mancos to advertise Aztec relics for sale. The word Aztec being a conscious misnomer, the concession to the widespread popular belief that the cliff dwellers had been Aztecs, which Richard knew they were not. In 1890, four years before, he began to offer relics for sale. The Mancos paper printed advertisements reading, Hildeben and Bauer, Assayers, Aztec Relics, Ute and Navajo Indian Curios, First Avenue, Mancos, Colorado. Such notices appeared every week. As part of their business in relics, Hildebrand and Bauer grub-staked digging parties to go into Mesa Verde cliff dwellings and bring back anything that might be saleable. No protest was made at the time, although this was nothing less than subsidized vandalism. And I feel like New York City Get me to the farm